everyone, and welcome to today's Talking Point presentation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people listening today or in the future. And especially today, we would like to recognise the disproportionate impact of gambling harm on Indigenous communities. I also acknowledge the expertise, the bravery and the wisdom of people with lived experience of alcohol, drug or gambling issues, which helps us shape services that are accessible and safe in meeting people's needs. I'm Victoria Manning, an associate professor at Monash University and head of research and workforce development at Turning Point. And I'll be facilitating today's session. How uh, three sides of a coin, sorry, how three sides of the coin performance empowers people with lived experience of gambling harm to educate the community and professionals, presented by Judy Avasar, Catherine Simmons, OAM, Anna Barsley and Fiona Reid. Talking Point is a regular series of publicly available lectures that aim to inspire, inform and challenge the notions of what we know about addiction and its impact across society. We like our webinars to be interactive, so please do ask questions anytime via the Q&A function and they'll be answered by the presenters at the end of the presentation. They are also recorded and available to view on the Turning Point website about a week after the presentation. So I'll now, I now like to introduce our presenters. Judy Avasar from Shark has coordinated Three Sides of a Coin project, Harm, uh, Harm Project, since its inception around 12 years ago. Judy has passionately carved a path for Three Sides of a Coin, so that today it is recognized as a successful model for professional development in allied sectors, including mental health, drugs, alcohol, family violence, and criminal justice. Anna Bardsley, a former businesswoman, writer, performer, singer, and accidental advocate, lost 10 years to Pokey's addiction. Meeting others who had been harmed by gambling, she saw that recovery was possible. Anna speaks honestly about the shame of being a gambler and the struggle of recovery, and has appeared on TV, radio, and newsprint, and Anna works at the AGR Alliance for Gambling Reform. Catherine Simmons, OAM, is the artistic director of Three Sides of a Coin. Her focus is in the space between lived experiences of communities and the language of art. For three decades, she's provided people with a creative space to which, in which to discover the needs to speak and speak the unspoken. She works together with participants to transform their stories into theatre. And finally, we have Fiona Reid, who instigated the evaluation of the Three Sides of the Coin program with Deacon in her previous role. She provided leadership and a public health lens during the research design, data collection and write up. And she's now working as a senior manager, health promotion and engagement at role at Access Health and Community. So over to you, Judy. Thank you very much, Vic. Uh, my name's Fiona Reid, and I will. Um, we're very excited to share with you all today the evaluation that we've undertaken about three sides of the coin to explore whether this lived experience um, performance uh, program increases audiences' understandings of gambling harm, audience empathy towards those impacted by gambling harm, and whether it leads to positive changes in attitudes and behaviours of the professionals attending, both in the short and longer term, and the impact of the performing arts in this. Uh, so today, uh, firstly, we're going to hear from Judy Avasar, Three Sides of the um, Side Coordinator, followed by Anna Bardsley and Catherine Simmons. And we'll also see some of the videos about the performances and then I will take you through some of the research findings and we'll have time for questions as well. So next, I'm going to hand over to Judy. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. So as, uh, as you've heard, Three Sides of the Coin Project empowers people with lived experience to perform their stories, to educate uh, the community and professionals. And just to give you the context of gambling in this country, we are the biggest losers in the world by far per capita, 25 billion a year. So the research was motivated by the positive feedback that we've been receiving over the years from the evaluations after each performance, where we would ask people, what is something new you've learned and how may this impact your attitude or your practice? So as a synopsis of our history, we began you know, 12 years ago when we invited 
um, Arnold Zabel, Melbourne writer, to run a series of storytelling workshops, story writing workshops with a dozen people who'd struggled with gambling addiction. And it was such a success that we, in the end, the outcome was an anthology of these people's writings. And we were asked to present at the Melbourne Writers' Festival. For this, uh, so you will hear, sorry, and when this book, only one person was able to actually put their name to their writing because of the shame and stigma around gambling. And that's Anna, who you'll hear from later. And then we, in order to prepare for the Melbourne Writers Festival, we got Catherine Simmons on board, who's an art, the artistic director, to, to work with the people to dramatise their writings. This was met with a standing ovation and made was the, the jump board for us to continue embodied lived experience performances to have impact on the community and on professionals. So how have we recruited people, our storytellers? It's not easy to get people to tell their you know, difficult stories of gambling, um, but we've run storytelling workshops. We've recruited through Gamblers Help Services and at our performances when people um, identify with, with, with our storytellers. So we have in our group both people who gambled and family members who've been affected. And I don't take that for granted that the two work together. So as was mentioned, our intention of three sides of the coin is really to change attitudes you know, to increase understanding of gambling harm and people's confidence to talk about it, to humanise the people behind the addiction, increase e empathy and reduce the stigma and shame. So there'll be more people speaking up and more people reaching out for help. So our, our intention is that gambling is on the radar of these allied health professionals in the in the different areas and that a screening question would be included in client assessment and of course to frame gambling as a public health issue so our performances not only educate about gambling itself but about its intersectionality with other health issues so we've performed in different in many different spaces, in conferences, offices, locker rooms, courtrooms, um, parliament house, and reached many sectors. As an example, in the mental health sector, uh, we've performed at Lifeline, at Headspace, and conferences. In the drug and alcohol sector, through the SHARK programs, through residential rehab programs, the task force and at conferences, through the family violence sector, through no to violence and men's behaviour change groups, and in the justice system through the magistrates, court staff and the con um, corrections staff. And in the financial world, we've uh, performed to financial counsellors at conferences and also with the banks in the banking sector with their vulnerability units. So that gives you a snapshot, and I'll now hand over to Anna to tell you why people would do this work. I put a reserved sign on the machine and went to the toilet, and everything looks different in there. Caught sight of myself in the mirror and thought, who are you and how the hell did you get inside me? How did I, how did I become you? You don't have to say anything. The words are running on a loop inside my head. Stupid, that's what you are. You're a stupid, stupid loser. Can't be trusted, can't be loved. It's shame that keeps us there. We cannot speak out because shame keeps us numb, keeps us dumb, keeps us in the zone. It brings us back again and again and again. 
the performers at three sides of the coin want to turn shame upside down. We won't live by it anymore. We will tell our stories as best we can, in the best way that we can, to change the conversation about gambling. It's hard work sometimes. You've got to unpack things that you're not quite sure you want to unpack. But it is about reconnection. The dis- addiction disconnects us. We know this. Recovery is about, the work of recovery is about reconnecting. It's not just about giving up what you were doing. It's about reconnecting to yourself, to other parts of yourself, to the people around you, to the possibility of what else you could be now. And in this space, there are places that you find yourself that surprise you. I, in a previous life, I was a singer and I had stopped all that. Music had had left my life. Everything good had left my life. And Catherine found out I could sing, and so there, there I was singing. And and I like that I can use something that's special to me. And um, even though I'm not as good as I used to be, you live with that. You just do it anyway. And it's kind of ironic to sing a fat old lady singing "Let Me Entertain You," which is a stripper song about the gambling industry. And it makes it makes people think differently, and it's a little bit lighthearted. And Judy talked about having people who were affected others in the group. When that first happened, it was a challenge for both sides of it. We kind of eyed each other off and thought, hmm. And we, and we, our stories have challenged each other. Those of us who gambled have had to face what we did to our families in another, on another level and in another way. And those of people who were harmed by somebody else's gambling had to see that that people are more than their gambling. And um, and we have a very, we're a very tight-knit group now. We support each, it's group work in, in a different way because as soon as you put human beings together, you, you have a group and we rub on each other sometimes and we annoy each other sometimes, but we also ignite each other and, and um, support each other and And we see each other, we witness each other, if that makes sense. We are, we don't tell our stories this way. We don't do this work because we we need to do it personally for ourselves anymore. It starts maybe with a little bit of that, needing to be heard. But we, we do it because we know that there are tens of thousands of other people who can't do it yet, hopefully, who are stuck back in the toilet at the venue, putting themselves down, seeing themselves in the mirror and thinking they're idiots. And we know they're not, and we want to change that. We want to change the language around gambling. We want to change attitudes to it. And we want people to know they're not alone. We have, we have learned to speak from the scar, not the wound. Thanks, Kevin. The dictionary definition of empathy is it's it's the ability to understand another person's thoughts and feelings in a situation from the point of view, from their point of view rather than your own. And the Oxford definition of performance is artistic enactment for an audience. So what's performance got to do with empathy? This research is measuring exactly that. It measures the capacity of performance to produce empathy in the audience. My role as the artistic director is to facilitate people and their stories. My responsibility then is to render the stories, to create, to weave, to direct these stories in a way that it honours as deeply as I know how the people that I've listened to and to powerfully communicate that to the audience. Like that is the responsibility. It's not about producing sympathy, it's about empathy. So stories 
have always been at the heart of human communication. And you know, theater and those words can sort of objectify it in a way, but really it's about the art of communication. And here we have a very, very, very important thing happening, which is the power of people's lived experiences, the authority of that meeting art to tell the story and to communicate. So three sides of the coin exists to tell the stories of gambling harm but actually it's the story of life. So how, 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 what is the process? So my role, I, I listen very deeply, as deeply as I can to each person, and I ask, what do you want to say? What happened? What happened that led you into gambling that, or that you were affected by your family's gambling, and what do you want? And that's where the conversation begins, and that's where the conversation keeps on growing up until now, because people are always evolving, then the script is always evolving because the people are there. So how they see themselves in their recovery is always changing and the work reflects that. So creativity, the importance of creativity, it's, is that it's an attitude. It's the ability in a way to not reject anything. Anything is possible when you're being creative. It's a way of listening. In fact, maybe that's the third side of the coin. What is the third side of the coin? So practically, how does the work get created? Like I said, I meet with people individually, like Anna said, then we workshop, we get together, and we script and write. And in those workshops, I think it's about understanding how to lead a process that builds people's capacity to stand up in their vulnerability and be powerful in that through to shame, as Anna already expressed, it, it, it shuts you down, it makes you hide, where performance is the antithesis of that. You're standing up, you're speaking up and saying what your truth is, and then that is crafted and woven with other people's stories. So in the workshops, Telling a story is not just information, it's not just words, it's the exploration of emotions, of silence, of images, of song. So, for example, uh, you might explore the inner mind of somebody. People get together, they collaborate, it might be, I, I want to stop gambling. But what's the other part of the mind saying, one more bit, it won't hurt? Or in family violence, just leave him. Just leave, I want to leave. No, tomorrow, tomorrow he'll be better. So it's an invitation to explore the many things people have experienced inside and to bring it out. That is the drama. But there's nothing to reject. There's no good, there's no bad. For example, one person, when we were first doing the work, said, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't, know. I don't think I want to do this. I think I want to hide. So that's exactly how the performance started. They crossed the stage, covering their face with the form guide, and everybody explored the theme of hiding. So workshops are a creative response to whatever's coming up in the group with the people. And that, I think, is the cornerstone of producing empathy because deep empathy is produced from listening and curiosity and wanting to know the other person. Ways of seeing, building images. We've explored images as a language. For example, in a workshop, you might say, here's a beer bottle, a glass on a table. What do you see? There's no one way of seeing it. Somebody might say, oh, that's coming home from work, relaxing, having a drink. Someone else might say, that's my father, violent, drunk, hitting my mother. Another person might say, that's my part-time job. There isn't a right answer. Everybody sees something differently. So the language of images is very important in performance. We have, and Anna does, she chucks money, bag on the floor. Another person might be hugging a children's chair. Or that children's chair might end up on a pokey stool representative of the lineage of gambling harm, the future generation. So how do we construct that? And how do those images help to produce empathy in an audience? That's what the work is about. So um, I think... Then it's about the audience. When we're in the audience, as Judy said, conferences, wherever we are, in a conference, everybody looks at the stage. So we don't come from the stage. We come from behind, in between. Disrupting the normality of perception helps people 
to unlock and to experience differently and, and really be immersed in the experience. So the performance in lots of ways is an anti-model. It doesn't give a solution. The people standing up are the hope. They are the solution. But really it puts forward questions and then after every performance there's question time with the audience. But now, Fiona, let's have a look at a snapshot of three sides of the coin, performance and audience commentary. Thank you. Yes, I'm lonely, okay? What do you want me to fucking say about it? <sighs> That's what happens. You get depressed, so you go and you blow your money. And then you're depressed because you've blown your money, so you go and you blow more I guess I'd money. never really thought about it like that, the two women sitting at the poker machine. It helps bring to life what we don't actually see. We've had a lot of gambling um, sessions in this conference and I think yours was the most effective in getting people to understand. You know, it can be pretty dry, but you guys just take it to another level. I live like this, I can't. We're working with people in trauma all the time anyway and to see it live and in your face in the way that we saw it, uh, I, you know. It's a great deal of help because that's when we get exposed and able to open our heart and able to talk about it. He's always got money. Oh, I borrowed up money off Bill last week. Okay. Just send a text message. The head and shoulders, this is above anything I've experienced to date. This is not stuff out of a textbook, which makes it so much more powerful. It's a living case study. Can I borrow $100, please? Smiley it's face. so meaningful and powerful around allowing yourself to feel what it might be like. <laughs> What our work brings is the lived experience and the power of that, the courage of that, and everybody feels it. Thank God I'm not the only one, you know, that's been through that turmoil. Moments like today help me to reconnect from up here down to my heart. I thought this couldn't be these people's stories because how could you get up and, and share this? And what a privilege for us to have been there. So I just want to commend you for what you've done. I think it is so culturally significant in breaking the silence. Thank you for three sides of the coin and long may you go on to touch many, many people and many, many lives. So that, that is a snapshot of the many places and spaces and audience interactions, and that's what we're going to talk about now, actually, is that after every performance, as Judy said, for many years we've been asking the audience, what, what is something that touched you? What do you feel? After every performance, actually, I ask the audience, now it's over to you, no right or wrong, what do you feel? Just one word, no right, no wrong something that somebody said, an image, what stays with you. And then people start to share and it opens up. So the performance is the catalyst to the conversation. And this research has actually captured that immediately after performances and six months later to understand what is stuck, what, is, what has remained. So now what we'll do is that we will now watch Anna's performance, a video that's been created, and then I would like you here now in the webinar to ask yourselves what's something you feel, think, what questions are stimulated, and then you can channel those towards the discussion points and questions at the end of this session. So, again, over to you, to Anna's story. Thank you.
in the beginning it was just a bit of fun. Which, which one of these buttons do I press? Night out with the girls. Oh, look, she's going to get it. Cheap and cheerful dinner and a flutter. She's going to get it. Oh, nearly. It wasn't a problem. We all knew how to walk away. 20 bucks would last all night. Feel free. Free coffee, free tea, free spins. Free parking, free rewards points, free spins, free spins, free spins, free spins. Free spins, free yourself, free yourself, free yourself. Free, 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 free lots of things. Free yourself, leave your troubles at the door. Can I get you love? She remembered what I wanted. Can I get you, love? I'll be back. You don't have to say anything. The words are running on a loop inside my head. Stupid. Stupid loser. Can't be trusted. Why don't you just stop? Look at what you're doing. Nobody knows. It's a secret. I don't like that I'm lying to myself and to other people about where I am and what I'm doing. Where's the exit? My brain is on automatic. I don't remember driving in. Can somebody tell me where the exit is? How do you get out of here? I want my brain back. I want to stop. Po pokies? You can do this. One, two, three, four, five, yes! I don't do that anymore. Free spit, no. Oh, there's a jackpot. Free, free drinks, a pipe. No, I don't do that anymore. I don't Oh, but just one more. No, but no. I can do this. But it's not simple. I want it. God. How do you get help if you don't tell somebody? For years I walked past them, didn't even see them. Everybody takes a break and goes to the toilet and your brain works differently in there. I hope I can give up properly one day. God, the damn things are on every street corner. Just drive straight home. Shit, they're everywhere, aren't they? I've got to say, the counselling helped a lot. You're doing really well. It's really hard what you're doing. Recovery, let's call it what it is, to be recovered from this addiction. I see the truth. What my kids missed out on? Because I wasn't there. If you yell at yourself, if you call yourself a loser, it doesn't fix anything. You will not bully yourself. You'll find a way. Bring kindness. Now I have a choice. No more going to a venue for anything. Let's go somewhere else. I'm more than that person who went gambling. Who else am I? That's a good question. The writer, the traveller, the singer. Speaking up when I have something to say. The harm that gambling had done to me was real. Why do I do this? Be so public? There are thousands of people out there, like me, who are too ashamed to speak up. When you're in the depths of shame of a gambling addiction, you don't tell anybody. You don't tell yourself how bad it is. This is not fun. It's supposed to be entertainment. This is not entertainment. It's time to change. It's time to change the language. It's time to change the culture. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. People often say to me, you're so brave. I was brave to go into recovery. That's brave. Recovery isn't going back to who I was before. It's becoming the person I was always meant to be.
So some of the common questions that we are asked are, how much money did you lose? More than I meant to, more than I ever wanted to, but money was only part of it. I lost 10 years of my life. 10 years that I could have been doing way better things than pissing money down the throat of a poker machine, hiding. 10 years of time with my family, with my kids. What what might have helped you? What were the obstacles to you reaching out for help? I, I came to realise when I stepped away from it that the language around gambling was the biggest obstacle because the terms problem gambler, there's only a few, don't worry about them, responsible gambling, set a limit and stick to it, all that stuff, it made it worse because it made it me and it made it only me. It meant all the responsibility was mine instead of some of the responsibility and most of it actually belonging to the dangerous product and the and the loose legislation. And I remember once you talked about tobacco as a yeah, as an analogy. Yeah, that, that it's a similar thing. They, that harmful industries use language that deflects the blame from themselves to usually their customers, which is quite ironic. Mm-hmm. And and for some, you know, because we often are presenting in the mainly in professional development context and community context, but people often ask, how should I start a conversation with somebody, somebody that might be experiencing gambling harm? That's an, a, a tough, it's a tough one to think about doing. The, the first thing you have to have is a trust relationship, that they trust you enough to tell you something. And it won't be one conversation, it'll be several conversations. And it might start with just a simple, are you okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, if you're if you're with someone who seems to be gambling in an unhealthy way, then you can say, hey, are you okay? Is this is this fun? But it has to be non-judgmental. You have to steer away from the language of, that makes them the problem. Um, and Tell them it's possible. Change is possible. Yes, and I think many and hang around. Just hang around. And many times people have always said about talked about planting the seed to yes. ask directly about the yes. gambling as well. Yes, premised on trust. Yeah. Yes, it takes it takes a long time to see it in yourself, you, and that's the first place that you have to be able to see it in yourself before you can deal with it with other people, and that comes in little pieces. Did for me anyway. It was so. Thanks, Anna. The as I said, our performances are the catalyst. The conversation and the interaction with the audience is just as important. What are the questions? What is the performance stimulated? What do they want to say themselves? And the research is about that. So um, it's about the capacity to inspire that conversation and to remember it six months later. So now I'm going to hand it over to Fiona, who will actually talk about the research and the results of the research. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine and Anna um, and Judy for that uh, introduction and insight into the three sides of the coin, uh, professional development performances. Uh, So now I'd like to um, have the opportunity to share with you about the research and the evaluation of three sides of the coin and do the lived experiences performances increase audience understanding of gambling harm, their empathy to those impacted by gambling harm and um, others, and positive changes in the attitudes and behaviours of professionals in both the short and longer term, Um, and the impact of performing arts um, on these outcomes. So this research was a collaboration with Deakin University and we were lucky to work with some experts, including um, Professor Nikki Dowling and Dr Anna Thomas, um, uh, to help us lead this research, um, which is uh, currently being submitted and is under peer review at a journal. So today this is a snapshot of the research that's being published. Uh, We used a mixed methods approach to the research, including Um, quantitative and qualitative data collected through both a survey of audience members immediately post-performance 
as well as a survey of audience members at a, a follow-up period of between three and 12 months after the performance that they attended. And we had approximately 400 um, sur surveys uh, returned. Today, we're going to focus on the surveys from staff or professionals working in sectors that are allied to gambling harm, including alcohol and other drugs, mental health, family violence, justice, finance. Um, um, but the data we're looking at today excludes the staff working in the gambling help sector. And importantly, this data was collected between 2017 and 2019, so it was before the pandemic, uh, and it was collected um, after pro live performances. Um, later, we uh, created the videos, as you saw today, and the professional development um, sessions now have the option of in-person or video. So research findings, three sides of the coin successfully uh, increased professionals' uh, reported understanding of gambling harm, empathy and respect to those affected by gambling, and it created positive and, importantly, sustained changes in attitudes and behaviour. Uh, and we found that the three sides of the coin storytellers' use of these artistic methods that uh, Catherine and Anna have so beautifully described to share personal stories in a powerful and emotive way does elicit personal critical reflection amongst audience members. So that connection between the cognitive and the emotion and how that lasts over time. So I'm first going to show you some of the quantitative results and then um, some of the um, the qualitative. So as a result of participating in the professional development, professionals reported that along the bottom, they have an increased understanding of gambling harm, increased empathy towards people impacted, and an increased confidence to ask their clients about gambling. So the blue uh, graphs on the left are the survey results immediately post-performance. So you could see that we had an 89.5% of professionals reported they had increased understanding of gambling harm, 95.4% increase in empathy towards people impacted by gambling, and 87.8% reported they had increased confidence to ask their clients about gambling after they'd um, participated in the professional development session with the live performance. And the green graphs on the right are the results at three to 12 months follow-up after the professional development session. So you can see from these results that not only did professionals report uh, increased understanding, empathy and confidence, but that that uh, increase has lasted over time. Now, some of the qualitative themes included an understanding around the complexity and scale of gambling harm in Australia, the impacts to the individual and beyond individual, and that unpacking that understanding of shame and stigma, as well as work practices. So how to effectively engage with someone harmed by gambling, how to ask an individual and have a conversation about gambling, um, being present to uh, identifying where there may be gambling issues and working in a respectful and empathetic manner. Now, directly, some of the professionals' reflections included the impact of gambling has been more humanised. I came away with a new sense of empathy for both the person experiencing gambling issues and their family, how it under affects the well-being of families and children. The, I definitely changed my attitude and call, it called on me to reflect on my own biases. The sharper connection between gambling, shame and suicide being more conscious of asking people about gambling and being more aware of the shame and stigma surrounding these behaviours and noticing issues around money, being more likely to ask if gambling may be a problem for the person that they're talking to. Now, these reflections, importantly, lasted over time from intentions, uh, post-performance to behaviours and practices three to 12 months later. So these reflections are for the same individual post-performance. This person, this professional, um, stated that they had probably held some negative beliefs, but they've definitely changed these beliefs. 
And that same person, three months to 12 months later, said that they had more empathy towards people with gambling issues. Another professional stated that they would be more open to asking about gambling. And afterwards, they said that they now do ask more often about gambling, both to client, about family members and their thoughts around this. Uh, another individual said that they would be more open to understanding and be sensitively curious to having a conversation. And this person, as a, a leader in their organisation, said they've now included this issue in mentoring sessions to junior staff and also considered it in service planning and delivery. So the impact of the professional development has had an impact over a longer term. Now, we talked earlier uh, about the important connection that the artistic methods, performance and sharing the lived experience can have both at a cognitive and at that emotional um, level. And it was important in this research to understand the impact that the, the arts have in um, the results for this evaluation. So we found that the use of performing performance arts continued to provoke this sustained impact reflection and empathy. That the surveys post-performance um, by people with lived experience, um, sorry, post-performance, um, audience members said that the performance by people with lived experience was a personal, a powerful way of connecting to the issue. And then the follow-up survey, which was three to 12 months later, uh, found that the use of theatre was an effective way to present the material. And again, that the performance by people have experienced gambling harm was a powerful way to connect to the issue. So three sides of the coin, use of the performing arts is a powerful way to create this um, immediate and lasting impact. Finally, some strengths and limitations of this research project. A strength has been the involvement of a lived experience advocate throughout the research design, interpretation and write-up of the results. Uh, and we spoke earlier about the importance of the use of language, and that's been really important through the survey questions, through interpreting uh, the results from audience members, and also ensuring that the write-up of the research um, echoes the public health approach. Uh, it examined both the short and longer term impacts that Three Sides of the Coin has uh, on the audience members' um, behaviours and practices. Um, however, their research did not have a uh, pre-post design, so we did not collect data um, from audience members before they saw the performance. So that is a brief summary. Uh, if you would like to contact Three Sides of the Coin to present your organisation either in person or using the online approach or to run storytelling workshops with um, people's lived experience, please contact Judy Avasar, and I understand these details will be shared with you as part of the email after the um, session today. Now I would like to hand over to Vic. Thanks, Fiona, and thank you to all of you for that incredible, really powerful explanation and I think illustration of three sides of the coin. Um, I think that video, Anna, really does capture the you know, the sort of chaos and contradictory cognitions, it really gets you that sort of, you feel like you're there, you know, you experience that reality and truth. It's it's so powerful. And I'm so impressed by the reach in terms of the number of audiences and the number of sectors that you've had with such a small team. It's it's brilliant work. It's really fantastic work. Well done. Um, I don't think we have any questions in the, oh, we have one coming in, but I just, first of all, before I go to that question, wanted to ask you, Anna, what, is, what do the results of the evaluation mean to you? They mean a, an enormous amount to all of us, the performers at Three Sides of the Coin. We it's, it's often hard work. It's, you know, we put our lives aside to do this stuff and you, you wonder what impact it's having, if it's having any. Um, and to, and we, we knew from what Judy had been sending us that it was having impact, but this research proves it. It's out there and it says, yes, what you're doing is valuable and, in fact, very valuable. Um, so it's it's yeah it's encouraging and heartwarming and yeah, it'll keep us going. I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, somebody's asked if 
uh, where people who are themselves experiencing harm from gambling can, can view these performances online? Uh, well, I think the best would be to contact me, uh, Judy J at Shark, and we can. They're not the the, and we can discuss all the different modalities and how we can, someone can view them. Yeah. Thank you. And at, at the beginning, Anna, you spoke about the need for all for speaking from from the scar and not the wound. And I wondered if in the performances you touch on people's recovery sort of trajectories or, or really what sort of was was effective in, in getting to where um, people have gotten to, you know, beyond gambling harm. We, we're constantly trying to add that level to the performance because, because this is stories of, of, of hope and living another life is the is the proof that that there is a, an opportunity to be different and we are all different we're all different because we owned it because we we did our work and because we're doing our work because it's an ongoing thing i i went to poker machines because of a a difficult family life with my now ex-husband and, and i'm still years later unpacking what that means to me and and what, what it was that I needed to do differently then that I still need to do now, which is put myself on the list. I never, I got to that point of going to poker machine use because I I needed a break. So how do I give myself a break that I deserve better than poker machines? So it's a, con and I've, I've had years, my whole life, I was never on the list. So it's not going to happen overnight. And I think uh, further to that, I think the recovery narrative which is in the last two chapters of Anna's film, in performance, uh, like the, it's that, the understanding of that actually tends to happen more in the conversation with the audience where the performance is a provocation and, you know, you've got limited time to capture the weaving of many people's stories and the essences and the pits of people's experiences. And like I tried to say before, the hope is and the celebration is people who've been harmed by gambling as a gambler, people who've been affected by people's um, loved ones gambling, standing up on the stage together in, in a performance together and owning it and claiming it and then talking about at the end part, things that they've discovered now, like Ken says a fantastic thing. The prison, uh, one of our participants who was an ex-policeman who went to jail for um, gambling, embezzling funds, he says in a prison that we think we're in doesn't have to be. So it's sort of that internalisation. So there's wisdom. I suppose what I'm trying to say, the wisdom that each person has, we explore what that wisdom is and capture that gem. And it is in the performance, but in the short videos, you don't see it all. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question around how you sort of left feeling uh, after a performance. Does it does it ever sort of bring up sort of those traumatic experiences or, yeah, how to, how to, how to impact on you? Not only in performance, but doing the work, writing the work, finding what you want to say, Choosing because we choose what we what we divulge. It is uh, there is a dignity of risk here that the each one of us has a choice about what we share and what we don't share. And it, an example is that I my backstory is of I two of my five children have died. I was in an abusive relationship, and um, you know there's all kind. Of, I grew up never thinking I was good enough, and so it started off with layers of hard to handle, and and then. We, Catherine and I looked at it and, and I ended up with a monologue that was long and hard to do because it was um, very emotional and um, it was a very powerful piece. And now I've moved to another way of telling that story and it's it's like a once upon a time. And so I've made it easier for me to do. But it's my choice how I do it. And, and I have to say that I still have therapeutic counselling because I'm still in recovery. I'm recovering from life, uh, and I and doing this work, advocacy work, is hard work. You you keep bumping up against the never good enough. Why would anybody want to listen to me? You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. And so, and I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to be somebody 
different than I was. So I will do the work and so will others. And just to add to that, I think, you know, I was trying to say before the evolution, like Anna just explained, the evolution of who she is changes. The script isn't set in stone. It can change today yeah. because that's more relevant. So, um, yeah, strong emotions come up and it, and it's tough stuff, mm -hmm. but the power of the group together, the feedback, the this now, the research, it all, all goes together to create change. It's not and an easy we, conversation but a powerful one. And when it's emotional for one of us or any of us or all of us, we look after each other. Yeah. We, are, we, know, we know each other's stories and we know each other's soft points and we know what hurts and, um, and we look after each other. And there is a definite, I mean, there's an adrenaline a rush that comes with just trying to remember your lines. You think, oh, my God, I'm going to forget my lines. And um, and so when it's all over, you go, oh, my God, thank God it's done. <laughs> and and so you have the adrenaline drop, but that's normal for any kind of performance. So, And I'll just add there that we have very strong relationships with the Gamblers Help Services mm -hmm. who are there also to support us. We have uh, consultation frequently with counsellors yeah. about how to how to debrief, how to how to work with the intensity that this brings up. Mm -hmm. But I think Anna's comment, the dignity of risk is a really important there's a duty of care that goes with it, but there is the dignity of risk that the that the person has the has the right and the choice to to do this in the way that works for them. Absolutely. Um, before I've got a couple of questions around um, really language and um, and who the responsibility lies with. But before we we go to those, can I ask you if you found the performances um, via video, as you demonstrated today, as as powerful as when they're in person? Well, in terms of the feedback that we've received, it has been noted. People who have seen the live performance and in the video, they were surprised that. Uh, that it is as powerful for them. We have not yet uh, had a, an opportunity to do a formal evaluation, a research piece, which we would still love to do, yes. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I think um, it really it comes together beautifully. It really is fantastic in terms of the artistic kind of um, aspects of it and sort of on, as a layer on top of the, the story that's being told. It, it works really well. In fact, the videos were out fantastic all through COVID. It enabled us to keep on working and to run professional developments, and it was a, a fantastic thing. I could draw the analogy, though, how everybody got a bit sick of being on screen all the time. Theatre, is it's good to be with people in a room too. <laughs> you need both. Definitely. Well, I don't, I'm not sure if you can read any of these um, comments, but this one um, says... Three sides of a coin, you continue to amaze me. Your stories do have a deep impact on people's lives. Your stories touch many people's hearts and are, are, are an inspiration to many. Continue great work in sharing your stories. It truly is making a difference in helping break down the, the shame and stigma surrounding gambling harm. Your live performances are very powerful and brave. So that was from Guy. Um, the question I, that I saw was around really... Um, I think more to, to, to language, what, or was it how we, sorry, just give me one second. And there was something about responsibility? Yes. So is there such a thing as a responsible gambler? Can one gamble without harm? Well, I couldn't. Um, but although it, I, I have to say that in the beginning, my introduction to poker machines was seemingly harmless. Um, I, and I, I went to... Out for girls' nights out three times a year for like five years or more. Didn't do it any more often than that. Never lost any more than $20 in a session. And it really did not seem to be a problem until I ended up there on my own. And I think the problem is that with poker machines particularly, they are designed to addict. And I've come to think that if you spend enough time with them, they'll get you in the end. Um, and it depends on what else is happening in your life. If you if your life takes a turn, I've I know men who did sports gambling happily and fairly harmless, seemingly harmlessly for long periods of time until something critical happened in their life, and then they it was a tipping point for them, and they and they ended up in massive trouble, losing everything, house, superannuation, the lot. Um, so, I think it's a dangerous product. I think it's a dangerous business, a predatory business model. So you, it, it, if you're going to 
play with it, be careful. And I use play in inverted commas because it's not playing, it's gambling. Thank you. Um, we have a question more around, again, really help seeking. Um, what You sort of touched on this a little, I guess. What, what would you say to somebody who is just starting to gamble? Are you sure you really want to do it? Um, I, I'm very wary of any kind, any, gambling is such a predatory thing in Australia now. We have, we know, look at the gambling ads that we have on television. The gambling industry is after every single human being on this planet. Mm -hmm. They want our kids. They want old people, young people, middle-aged people. They don't care who we are. They don't care what our background is. They just want our money. And, and they have a business model that's predicated on addiction. So while it's legal, is it ethical? Is it healthy? Is it useful? I think that uh, I know for me, my life is way better without gambling. I, I, I did not need it. Um, it didn't bring anything good to me. It made everything worse. Yeah. Do, do there, any of the videos address um, the experiences of young men and sports gambling? I, I assume so. Yes, there is one of the videos, uh, a young man and his sports betting and where that led him into big trouble. Yeah. And that's certainly a direction that we are ex exploring to go to the, the younger generation and to look at gaming and as a precursor to gambling and to get those stories out there so we can start conversations among young people yes and can i add to that we need to be careful we don't stereotype um young people's gambling as men it's not only young men again the industry is after young women as well yeah and is that is that video available on your website well, all the videos are are available but they're not available on youtube or available because it's about the um, respecting the story and it's not there for commentary on the floating on the web we made that decision in the beginning so again contact judy and within a controlled environment we share have the conversation anybody who wants that we we, we can create the opportunity but it's not available just to go search it by yourself no Okay, thank you so much for clarifying that. Well, we are at time, so I just want to thank you all again, Judy, Catherine, Anna, and Fiona, for um, for giving us this wonderful presentation today. It's been an absolute, you know, pleasure to to hear the fantastic work you do, and I look forward to seeing more in years to come. Thank right. you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.